Well, first I'd like to thank the Academy. Wrong script, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Budget Day. Glad to see everyone here. Uh, very encouraging to know that there's still quite a few neighborhood council people that are interested in this. I, I never became a budget rep or a budget advocate. I kind of, you know, gloss over when, when, when we start talking about things like that. <laughs> uh, I leave that to, uh, to a very capable person in my neighborhood council, and heaven forbid uh, he ever decides to, to, to quit, I'm lost. So there you go. Um, a lot of activities today, and it will end with the um, election of um, budget advocates. All of you who are interested, uh, get prepared to, uh, to tell the uh, other budget reps in your regions as to why you're interested, what you think you can bring uh, to this whole process as a budget advocate, and, uh, and uh, why you should be elected. I've heard a lot of talks over the last couple of years. I've seen some impressive people. Um, if you want to become a budget advocate, all I can say is that's great, be prepared to work, but it's a very satisfying thing. You'll learn a whole lot about the city and you'll be able to bring that back to your neighborhood council members. So that, that to me is the important thing. Um, I'd like to, well, we have, uh, we have two of our commissioners here that were gonna be here this morning and I think uh, the other two believed that it began about nine o'clock. That may be my fault. That's when I thought it was gonna begin. So my, I may have given them some, some bad um, information. But uh, Joy Atkinson is here. Joy. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Joy is from the uh, South Side. And uh, Debbie, Debbie Webby. Debbie is from Central. Uh, we're waiting for, is Eli outside? Eli, where are you? Holler at Eli, get him in here. Uh, okay, Maggie's coming, okay. Um, we're expecting, if he, if he sticks his nose in, Eli Lippman, who is from the west side. And um, I'm told that Maggie is on her way, Margaret uh, um, uh, Duret Quiroz. And uh, she represents uh, the, uh, the Northeast. Uh, Eve Sinclair, um, uh, who represents the North Valley, uh, had an emergency, could not be here today. Uh, I uh, represent the South Valley. And unfortunately, um, our, um, <clears throat> our harbor uh, commissioner has had to um, resign. I believe he was moving out of the city. And our city charter says you've got to be um, um, uh, reside within the city to, to be a, um, um, a member. Ah, here he is, that looks like Eli. Eli waved to everybody, he's way in back there. Coming up on this side, there he is. <laughs> Eli brought the Metro in, a good, a good thing for all of us to think about. Um, next, uh, next up um, um, is a young man that I just met, I'm very impressed by this young man. Um, and he's also wearing a suit and tie, and I came casual this morning, but uh, looks good. Uh, Aaron Castaneda, he is your Vice President of Finance for the California Student Association. Um, he's a, um, um, uh, a, you're a junior, third year, I forget. Uh, he's a junior at uh, Cal State Los Angeles uh, where our friend uh, Rafe Sonenshine is, um, is ensconced. So I'm gonna have him come on up here and uh, introduce some more people. Aaron, come on up. Thank you, Len. Good morning, budget advocates and community stakeholders. My name is Aaron Castaneda, a third year finance student at Cal State University, Los Angeles. On my campus, I serve in our student government as vice president for finance. I also serve as vice president for finance at the California State Student Association, which is the student government of all 23 campuses of the California State University system. I am in a unique position. No one in my campus has ever become in, a, in, in, a, in an executive position in CSSA, nor held both positions on my campus and at the system level at the same time. While it is a privilege to serve in these positions, I understand it is a burden to keep my student government operating. We have to be strategic. Finances is a monetary way of showing priorities set by the organization. I appreciate the chance to speak as a stakeholder here today and want to offer you an example of how city budgetary issues become student government issues as well. 
This year, our campus began a UPASS program, an agreement with Metro to provide affordable bus passes to Cal State LA students. However, as part of that agreement, my student government has been forced to subsidize these rates so students can get cheaper bus passes. For anyone who attends Cal State LA, they understand that it is a commuter school and many people use Metro to arrive and leave campus. While we recognize this UPASS program is beneficial to thousands of students on our campus, my student government cannot subsidize all bus passes. I thought when Measure M passed, Cal State LA students would enjoy the benefit of having cheap bus passes, but that is not the case. Instead, the cost gets thrown to the student government on, on my campus to determine how much to allocate. Consider this. In order to fully subsidize the UPASS program, we will need to allocate 18% of our $1.4 million operating budget every year. Put simply, I feel that there are certain things that my student government is trying to fund that should not be the responsibility of a small student government, and I question the transparency of funding practices and use of the taxpayer money. I applaud the work of the budget advocates that are doing to educate the public and influence budgetary practice. And I look forward to the rest of the day where we can learn more about the process and citizen involvement. And so, with that said, it is a great pl pleasure to introduce you to Jacqueline LeKennedy, member of the Citywide Budget Advocates. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to be given this opportunity to deliver these few remarks today on this beautiful Budget Day 2017. Unfortunately, due to the passing of his mother, our co-chair, Mr. Jay Handel, could not be here today. So he has asked that I deliver the speech on his behalf. It is called A Budget Advocate's Journey. Budget policy is a recurring theme. In 2010, I began delving in the budget process. During my first, very first budget experience, it was done during very difficult times with the CAO forecasting never ending deficits and ever rising debts. Today, however, we have a healthier set of public accounts. As a budget advocate co-chair, I am more than ever convinced of the importance of having a proper city budget policy. Budgets are not just a mere accounting exercise. They are about achieving the best results for our Angelinos and their families from nearly $8 billion of existing spending every year. They are also about making sure that every new dollar spent is directed to the right areas to achieve a real impact on our city services and our quality of life. Not because, or should I say, not only because I love numbers, but because numbers have a real and direct impact on the well-being of all Angelinos. Without a sound budget policy, there could be no sustainable quality of life. There could be no funds for a proper infrastructure policy. There could be no base for economic growth. Therefore, I believe that efforts to reform and improve our city's budget system is the best a conscientious and socially minded city government could ever try to pursue. Ladies and gentlemen, in pursuing this journey together, let us all be reminded of what the famous poet Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, perseverance is not a long race. It is many races, one after another. Thank you for attending today, and thank you for your service to this great city. And now I will present to you the budget advocates 
who have worked tirelessly over this past year, looking through many, many financials, interviewing many city departments to make sure that there is transparency, to make sure that all stakeholders and Angelinos have a say in the budget process. Our co-chair, Mr. Jay Handel, again, could not be here today. Our co-chair, another co-chair, Ms. Liz Amston. Our vice co-chair of administration, Mr. John Lieberman. Our vice co-chair of communications, Ms. Joanne Ivanic Garb. Our secretary, Ms. Danielle Sandoval. Our assistant secretary, Ms. Jeanette Hopp. Our treasurer, Mr. Howard Katchen. And last but not least, our parliamentarian, Mr. William Morrison. And now, in no particular order, Yvette Ale, representing Region 9. She's not here. Uh, Mr. Brian Allen, Region 2. <laughs> Ms. Julie Berg, Region 10. <laughs> Mr. Kevin Davis, Region 1. <laughs> Ms. Adrian Edwards, Region 6. <laughs> Ms. Amy Fall, Region 7. Ms. Cindy Wu Freeman, Region 2. Mr. Craig Goldfarb, Region 12. Ms. Valeda Gori, Region 10. Mr. James Harnick, Region 6. Mr. Jack Humphreyville, Region 5. He couldn't be here today, but he has contributed. Ms. Ann Job, Region 1. Ms. Bridget Kidd, Region 9. Mr. Keith Kirkwood, Region 5. Ms. Monica Massey, Region 12. Mr. Michael Manjivar, Region 4. Ms. Carol Newman, Region 3. Mr. Christopher Perry, Region 9. Ms. Ava Post, Region 6. Mr. Rick Ramirez, Region 1. Ms. Barbara Ringret, Region 7. Mr. Marcus Rodriguez, Region 7. Mr. Patrick Siemens, Region 5. Ms. Linda Valencia, Region 8. Ms. Krishna Velasco, Region 2. And I think I've gotten everybody. So thank you very much. Uh, so next we have our beautiful and wonderful General Manager of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, Ms. Gracie Liu. Good morning, Neighborhood Council leaders. How are you guys? Yeah, thank you so much for being here. We're very appreciative of all your work, and thank you to the budget advocates. Um, you guys did an amazing uh, white paper, as usual, this year, and um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all the work that you all neighbor councils do, but particularly our budget advocates, because it is such a daunting task to go through the city budget and to do the work that you do. Um, I also want to thank our staff who support the budget advocates who are here today, and in specifically um, Mike Fong and John Darnell, who were very instrumental in uh, making Budget Day happen, so thank you. I also see Mary and Mario back there, and really want to appreciate their work too. Um, yeah, you know, I'm supposed to talk a little bit about what the department is doing, and um, as you guys know, we've uh, transitioned the funding program to the city clerk, and um, how many of you have seen the new online funding portal? It's pretty cool, right? 
Um, it's, that took many years uh, to get into place, and I really want to thank City Clerk for doing such a fantastic job. Um, you guys will see it soon, and it's, it's very impressive, and um, I'm very pleased with um, the final results of that. Uh, we're using tech in um, some pretty cool ways with civic engagement <laughs> next year. You'll see um, we're piloting an augmented reality app for civic engagement that we're looking to do in downtown. It's going to be pretty neat. You'll be able to hold up your phone on city streets and get a lot of information about what the city is doing. Um, from, from that, we may even have the mayor pop in you know, his augmented reality self um, to say hello uh, um, on this app. Another thing that we're looking at doing is um, with our civic youth, of having them help us put together a um, app, a gaming app that is for City Hall and so that any visitors to City Hall would have the opportunity to kind of play a game while they're here and learn um, about City Hall and also about how that they can um, become advocates for their communities. So um, in that sense, uh, we have uh, this amazing connection that we can use with technology to help us further um, civic engagement. So. Even though we have this technology, I do want to say that face-to-face -face interaction is still so key. And there's always a place for neighbor councils in your work and what you do. And so what you learn today and um, in about the budget, um, you do need to take back to your neighborhood councils and then share that with them and then have your neighbor councils share it with a community and have that interaction and that dialogue with them. Um, even if we can do it on a tech way, you still have to do that face to face and I can't tell you how important and how powerful that makes neighbor councils in your work um, to do that type of sharing of knowledge. So I encourage you, don't forget to do that, please. Take this information today and, and share it with um, your community so that you can get the results um, for your neighborhoods. Uh, and this is all possible um, because we have the efforts of uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti, um, his Office of Budget um, and Innovation, and also our controller Ron Galprin and our um, city council, particularly uh, Council President Herb Wesson, and our Budget and Finance um, Chair, uh, 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 Councilmember Kokorian. So again, thank you so much for being here today and for doing the work that you do. And I look forward to uh, meeting our new budget advocates and working with you in the following year. Have a good day. Thank you, Gracie. And now I'd like to present uh, City Council President Herb Wesson. So you call my name, I run out the back. <laughs> but I, I really don't enjoy speaking from uh, the podium. So I, I want to get out here with all of you folks because I love you and I highly respect you. So good morning. We can do better than that. Good morning. You know, I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, where's Ann? Ann, stand up. Come here. Ann, get your sign. See, Ann is the timekeeper. <laughs> okay, sit down, Ann. Sit down. See? <laughs> I love you guys. This is what government is all about. It's about people. It's about, uh, you know, um, it's not about we, the, the politicians. It's about we, the people. And this is what's pure, and this is what's good, and this is what's great about uh, government. So I just want to say, uh, I think I have some thank yous. Last September, I suffered from a bout of insanity, and I, I decided to also oversee the seventh council district. Uh, at, at, you know, as, as long as the, uh, along with the tenth district, and I have to say this: that it was one of the greatest experiences that I've ever had in my life. And I have made friends that I will have to the day that I die. And the reason why we were able to go in the 7th District and kind of keep the lights on was because of the partnership that I had with the neighborhood councils in that region. So would you give all of the neighborhood councils a round of applause? 
Whenever I, I needed them, they were there. And I saw some of you might know a guy named Tony Wilkinson. If, if you do, Tony was a retired, very active member of the neighborhood councils. When I took over that district for 10 months, I got him to come out of retirement. He worked his guts out, he did a great job. So when you see Tony up and about and other events, tell him that I said that he did a great job and I was fortunate to have him help me. Yeah, go. We and he was, a, a, like I said, a member of the neighborhood councils. What you guys do are critical and I have enjoyed working with you and we've done some good stuff. Uh, Mr. Krikorian will be here later in a few minutes, but he's not here now. But because of uh, the work with, or the partnership with Mr. Krikorian, for the past two years, the City Council has given an additional $5,000 to the individual budgets of every neighborhood council. And this year, because of the good work of Matt, uh, with the mayor's office and Mayor Garcetti, we actually put a $5,000 increase in our budget. So a commitment that I had made when I first came on was that we were gonna do our best to try to increase the neighborhood council's budget, and we've done that. So let's give the mayor's office and my colleague, uh, Paul Krikorian, a call. The, 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 I mean, let's, yeah, where, well, let's give Paul, not a call, give him a round of applause. Let's do it louder. He's in his car, driving to City Hall. Paul, we're giving you a round of applause. He's listening on his radio. I also want to congratulate my dear friend, where's Kareem? Kareem, stand up. Let's give her a round of applause. She just became an American citizen. And she's been unbelievably helpful to me. The point I'm trying to, to make is that you guys have so much to offer to the city of Los Angeles. And we really need to do a better job of working together, your council people and you. I'm proud that in the 10th district, how often do we, st stand up. How often do we meet? Holler and tell everybody what you do with your councilman. So I do that with, that's the kind of relationship you want to have with your council members. We meet early in the morning on Saturday. Maybe it's a two hour meeting, two and a half hour meeting. I let the neighborhood council set the agenda. We list kind of like a punch list. And we, every time we meet, we check off things, but we really get to know each other. And, and, and it's a great working relationship. And I'm proud of the work that I've done in my district, but no way on God's green earth could I have done any of it if it weren't for the partnership with the community, more importantly with my neighborhood councils. Because in my view, you guys are the purest form of government. You are elected just like me. You don't get beat up. I, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I, no, I take that back. I was going to say, you guys don't get beat up like me, but oh no, I misspoke. See, it's a tough job. It's a, it, 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 it's a tough job, and it's not about doing what you want to do. It's about doing what you have to do. Paul Krikorian is just, the, the guy that helped us get the extra money has just joined us. But anyway, we've been doing a lot of work with the neighborhood councils. With our great, and I mean our great controller and the mayor, we had a conversation about DWP reform. Now. We put something on the ballot, it didn't pass. It's probably my fault for not dealing more or better with some of the labor organizations. But the point I wanna make is that the controller's office, 
the mayor's office, the council office, and the neighborhood councils, we partnered and we had a series of hearings throughout the city of Los Angeles where we set up at a dais and I would be there and a rep from the mayor's office would be there and the neighborhood council would be there. And one of the reasons why we did it that way is because we want our community to really get engaged. And I thought that was good. And, and I think what's important for the neighborhood councils is for us to show the individuals that are not involved in the neighborhood councils that we get stuff done and that we were active. So I thought that was very positive. Joanne knows about it. Then late now what we've been doing, we and it's funny that we have, uh, where is she at? I gotta watch what I say. I can't curse because we have the LA Times with us today. She's a, Carrie, she's a great lady. She's gonna speak to you later. But what I wanna highlight because she and I just talked about it either this week or last week, you know we're having a series of hearings about cannabis. Or for those of you that are my age, weed. <laughs> and we're trying to figure out how we're gonna regulate, you know, because the voters in this city, the voters in this state voted to legalize recreational uh, use of marijuana but the neighborhood councils have been involved in most of the hearings that I've had. In fact, one of the panels where we discussed the effect was a neighborhood council panel. So we, Mr. Krikorian and my colleagues and I, respect the work you do, recognize it's important, but we want people who are not engaged to see that you are, because I believe that's how you recruit people, when they see that you're active and they see that, that we're actually getting things done. So I wanted to just come by before, Ann, give me, give me one thing, give me, yeah, get it. Just, just give me, see, Ann is flashing. I am temporarily being Ann. <laughs> but yeah, she's gonna hook me. I just wanna say that we've got so much work left to do, but together we can do it. One thing that I did learn from the LA Times and Carrie in particular, she got on me a few years ago about really not being engaged in, with the community and not letting them participate in hearings and I listened and for the past three years we've been over backwards to try to get our community engaged in government. And that's why we need you, when we make a request, what it, give us a community impact statement on how you feel about marijuana or how you feel about that. If we're trying to get you engaged, I need you to be engaged because if you are, it really helps us recruit other members to the neighborhood councils throughout the city of Los Angeles. So with that said, with that said, with that, with that said, I'm gonna sit down if you get out the way, Ann. Anyway, give Ann a round of applause, I love her. And you guys have a good meeting. I've gotta go to another event and they told me to dress California chic. So I'm hoping that that's what this is. I don't know what the hell that means, but I'm hoping that's it. Anyway, God bless you. Thank you all for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Herb. So next we have up next is Deputy Chief of Staff, Matt Zabel. Welcome, Matt. All right, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this because this is a... Uh, this is nice and, and I can see you. And, uh, all right, so thank you very much. Um, uh, so I want to do a couple of, uh, couple of things. I um, want to talk a little bit about kind of where we are um, in our continuing journey uh, uh, emerging from the recession, which we're still fighting our way out of. I um, want to talk about where we were, where we're headed. I also am going to want to uh, introduce um, our new deputy mayor, 
for uh, budget and innovation. Um, halfway through this budget process, the mayor asked me to take on a little bit larger role in the office. I'm still involved in budget issues, um, but uh, Miguel Sangalang uh, is the new deputy mayor, and so he'll, I'll have him come up and say a few things. Um, I also want to uh, point out uh, John Chavez, who is uh, right there, who goes to the same tailor as the council president, um, <laughs> uh, our budget director. Um, and uh, uh, Dan Caricelli uh, is the new executive officer for uh, budget and innovation as well. Um, so as I, as I said, um, you know, four years ago, you know, we're, we're about to start, and the mayor's about to start a new term, um, and it's a good opportunity to look back as to where we started and where we're headed uh, and the challenges that we attempted to deal with from the budget perspective in the first term. Um, you know, four years ago, we were just emerging from a massive financial deficit. Um, and when uh, the mayor took office, although the financial deficit was subsiding, the city faced a, a massive uh, service deficit. Um, if you think back four years ago in 2013, uh, we had a, a depleted fire department. Um, our police department, we had struggled to maintain the sworn staffing levels, but the civilian uh, levels were way down so much that so many officers were being pulled off the streets and doing civilian jobs. We had a 20 plus year uh, cycle for tree trimming. I mean, once in a generation tree trimming is uh, not acceptable under any standard. We had zero street reconstruction budget, uh, no sidewalk repair budget of any kind. Uh, DWP customer service wait times were over 30 minutes on, on occasion. Um, and so when the mayor said he wanted to go back to basics, um, from the budget perspective, that's where we focused the limited resources that we had. So we, are, we, are have, we now have a growing uh, fire department. We have a police department where we're investing in civilians again. Tree trimming, we're investing in getting that cycle down. We have a $30 million a year sidewalk repair program. Thanks to Measure M uh, and the uh, state gas tax, we are now uh, about to embark on a very robust and long overdue street reconstruction repair program. Um, and our DWP wait times are now uh, less than 30 seconds. Um, so the second term um, is going to be about building on that foundation. There's still so much work to do, but it allowed us to, uh, it now allows us to do some of the very big things that the city needs to do from a, from a budgetary sp perspective and a service perspective, most notably uh, dealing with our homelessness crisis um, and taking on um, a, our traffic and infrastructure uh, uh, transportation issues. Um, and so the mayor chose, um, in my view, the perfect person to take over Mayor's Office of Budget Innovation and Miguel Sangalang. Um, the second term is about implementation. Um, that is what Miguel does. Uh, he started uh, with the former administration running the performance uh, management unit um, and has been the fixer in the mayor's office. When we had the crisis, um, or the, not really a crisis, but when, this, when the article came out about um, uh, the inequity in how we're doing street cleaning, um, that project was handed to Miguel and his team uh, which, to figure out what was going on, and now we have our CleanStat program. Um, he has been, uh, uh, he put together and is running our general manager review process, which is a critical tool in holding the general manager's feet to the fire um, and enhancing the performance. Um, so Miguel will uh, come up and run through the basics of the 17-18 uh, budget, uh, and then we'll talk about the future. Miguel. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, just like to give a little bit more background uh, to myself. I was recently appointed deputy mayor, uh, uh, actually just a few weeks ago, July, uh, I'm sorry, June 9th. Uh, been in the city with the administration for four years and larger city uh, working in information technology, performance management, and obviously the budget for the last 10. Um, we did want to go through the budget highlights. And just to give a little bit more background, I think one thing that is critical for, for the next term as well is, is really a focus on equity. That's one of the reasons why we, we did clean stat how we did it. Uh, before, it was predominantly uh, on response times, but there was inequity in, in terms of what the cleanliness was actually out on the street. So we really changed it to an outcome-based uh, uh, process at that point. And so with the budget, 
Uh, it's about $9.3 billion in total, split between the general fund at uh, $5.8 billion and various special, uh, special funds at $3.5 billion. They had a different rate of growth uh, this past year with the special funds growing much faster at 8.3% uh, and then the general fund having more modest growth at 4.5%. That really required us to be much more critical in what we are investing. And that's where I really would like to thank the, the Council President Wesson and uh, Council Member Kikorian for, for their leadership and hard work. Uh, it was, they, they were key in delivering a prudent budget that actually invested in city priorities that made it safe, livable, more prosperous, and well-run. So some of these have been uh, kind of spoken about with uh, Matt. Uh, just a few key highlights. We've budgeted to hire 10,000 police officers. We're also investing a million dollars in a new associate community officer program. It's a pilot to really bridge the gap in recruiting for, for new officers. Uh, we're investing in body-worn cameras. That's equipment for, for greater accountability within our police force and $10.5 million to hire and train new firefighters. Uh, at, that's about 195 new, uh, but I think we'll end up netting after attrition about 75. With regards to Prosperous, we're investing $3.5 million in seven new community plans by 2018 and setting the expectation to update each every six years. Uh, this will be critical for smart growth and really providing the amenities that our community needs. Uh, and thanks to the voters, we're able to continue investments in addressing homelessness and have a total about $180 million that we're going to be investing. $76, of, uh, $76 million are going into permanent supportive housing and then $36.8 million to engagement and cleanliness programs. There's going to be two new clean streets teams, uh, one focused on our waterways and also something called line encampments to really focus on response to, to um, uh, the situation on the ground. And finally, as Matt was saying, we have uh, Livable, where we'll, we'll be investing $58 million in Vision Zero and street reconstruction programs. It's going to be the first time in decades. Uh, what I'd really like to point out there is we're, we're tasking our departments of Bureau of Streets uh, Services, uh, Department of Transportation, and Bureau of Engineering to really work together so that we can create not only safe streets, but better streets at the same time. Those are not mutually exclusive. Uh, we have $2 million more that we're investing in graffiti so that we can uh, improve the response to the next day service. $31 million in, in new sidewalk uh, repairs and $7.1 in tree trimming and stump removal. So really quickly, um, you know, we're going to be continuing the innovation fund which has led to new innovative programs such as the the nurse practitioner and fast response vehicle at, at the fire department. So we're really looking at new and different ways to deliver our services. Um, and we'll go into some of the, the more specific details on Well, well Run as, as Matt returns. Uh, what I would like to say though is that uh, John Travis and I are really looking forward to working with all of you this year. Uh, and I think we have to do it early and often because there's going to be some very critical challenges ahead. And I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but we had uh, a CAO white paper uh, that, that took the budget advocates white paper and aligned it to what, uh, what was presented in budget. So really your work has gone to changing the, the fundamental things that are you know, written in, in our biggest policy document in the city. So thank you. Thank you. How are we doing Next. on time? Do I have a couple minutes? Okay, I just want to uh, take a few, a few minutes to talk about um, what uh, the, the challenges uh, uh, ahead. I know the CAO is gonna uh, give a more detailed presentation, but um, you know, the budget that we proposed this year and, was, uh, and worked together with the council to adopt was um, a good budget, but it was a conservative budget. And it was a necessarily conservative budget because there are uh, a number of challenges that we know we are going to face and we are already facing currently um, uh, financially. So uh, first and foremost, uh, the challenge with our pension systems. We, um, we have uh, both systems, uh, fire police pensions and LACERs, are making decisions about the assumed rate of return. And those, uh, the uh, fire and police pensions has already made a reduction, uh, assuming the rate of return from seven, uh, down from seven and a half to 7.25%. That, in addition with other changes, other assumption changes that were made based on the experience of the system, um, will, alone require our contribution for 1819 to go up by $80 million. 
Uh, LASERS will take up that same type of decision in uh, the first, uh, the second week of July, and we anticipate that their decisions could require an additional 80 to 100 million dollars of required contribution. That, that is directly coming out of the general fund, which goes to pay for all of the critical services. Um, we have an ongoing liability challenge, over $150 million we spent this year. Um, we, there's a question mark around federal funding and programs that are backed by federal dollars, which we still have uh, great uncertainty around. And the, um, the big elephant in the room is um, when the economy is going to turn uh, down again. We are already in one of the largest growth periods that we've had uh, since a recession. Uh, it is a, a, another downturn is over, overdue. Um, and so it is critical that we are in establishing financial resilience in the budget. And so a couple of things that we've done this year um, in partnership with the, with the budget chair and, and the council president, um, we've, we've We've committed to having a 5% reserve. In 2007-8, when we headed into the last recession, our reserve was barely 3%. Um, and so we have a reserve fund over 5% uh, this year. We have also built in additional resiliency with the budget stabilization fund of uh, uh, nearly 100 million, a $20 million additional reserve for uncertainties, and then we've created a $20 million reserve for extraordinary liability payouts um, to help uh, absorb the uncertainties that we would be facing. Um, we are also having to be very judicious about staffing levels, and general managers have, you know, complained top to bottom that they don't have enough staff. Um, it is critical, and that's why uh, Miguel's uh, role is going to be even more critical moving forward, because we need to enhance technology at the same time as we're talking about having, a, uh, as we're having a conversation about restoring services, because it may not be that we need exactly the same amount of staff that we had in 2007 to deliver the same services or deliver them better. Maybe we need uh, to invest in technology. Um, and, on, um, and on that issue of, of liability, um, you know, some of the things that we're, that we're looking at and that we are doing for the first time in this budget is coordinating our, the way that we spend our dollars um, with Vision Zero and with Street Reconstruction so that we can focus on the areas where we have the most, where we're most susceptible for uh, lawsuits. We, we should fix the areas that have that the most dangerous conditions first so that we don't end up paying two or three times more as a result of uh, dilapidated infrastructure and an injury and a lawsuit. Um, so that is a, a big push um, that we're, we'll be taking on uh, this year. And then the only the last thing that I'll say, because um, my time is out, is that um, over the course of the year, as Council President um, uh, referred to as it relates to cannabis, there's going to be, uh, we're going to be very focused on identifying and preserving as many new general fund revenue sources as we possibly can. That includes cannabis, where we'll have a 10% gross receipts tax, in, 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 in addition to um, short-term rentals and other revenues that we would get through the uh, waste hauling franchise and others. So again, I want to thank you and for, for your ideas. Um, your white paper was very helpful. We're going to be pursuing many of your ideas. Uh, the mayor will be announcing his revenue commission uh, very soon. We've got one or two more appointments left to make. There will be two members on that commission from the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates. Um, so we look forward to having this ongoing conversation with how we can fortify the city budget and restore services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Now I'd like to introduce our very own city controller, Ron Galperin. Good morning, everybody. Um, really a pleasure to be with you, and thank you so much for uh, giving of your uh, Saturday morning to come in here about the budget of the city of Los Angeles. Just my kind of people. Um, uh, as many of you know, uh, I actually began my obsession with everything having to do with the city and its finances uh, as a neighborhood council board member, uh, and then as a uh, budget advocate as well. And uh, I got to meet so many other uh, budget advocates who spent a great deal of their time uh, delving into uh, the city's revenues and expenditures and opportunities to make things better, and that sort of fed my obsession a little bit more to uh, eventually run and become the uh, controller of the city of Los Angeles. So who knows, right now among all of you, uh, we may have a uh, future uh, controller as well. 
Um, neighborhood councils, of course, I think have an absolutely vital role. Uh, what you're supposed to do is really, uh, among other things, uh, monitor the delivery of city services. That's, in fact, what the charter says. And uh, you're the uh, eyes on the ground, as it were, because Look, I'm called controller, but that does not mean that I get to control everything in the city of Los Angeles. I think of it as an aspirational title. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, your job is to really be out there and to see how these delivery of services are actually uh, working. Now, a uh, quick word or two about what the controller does. Some of you, uh, I'm sure, are aware. A few of you may be just getting an introduction to the, uh, to the structure of the city of Los Angeles and to uh, its budget. But uh, among other things, uh, we're in charge of paying a small little intimate group of 45,000 people uh, every two weeks. Uh, we also uh, distribute the payments for everything the city buys in goods and services. Uh, we also do audits, both financial and performance. We do the financial reports, and we do a lot of the uh, open data, particularly relating to the finances of the city. And uh, we have included now hundreds of metrics, of dashboards, of infographics, of story maps, as it were. Uh, and we have our control panel, which if you haven't had a chance to check out, uh, I would uh, heartily recommend that you do, uh, where you will find all of those expenditures, all of the revenue sources. By the way, you can take that data, you can download it, you can Facebook it, you can tweet it, uh, you can create uh, all sorts of different apps off of it. And uh, we've got also our utility panel, our geo panel. By the way, the utility panel is all about uh, DWP and its uh, expenditures. Uh, the geo panel in which we're taking a lot of the data of the city and mapping it in a variety of different ways because you can see a different picture when you map it, of course. Uh, our economy panel, which I'll show you a little um, preview of as well, in which we look at uh, various economic indicators throughout communities in LA. And the property panel, where we, for the first time, actually map the 8,975 properties that are owned by the city within the county of LA. We're arguing, arguably the largest owner of, oh, thank you the largest owner of real estate in Los Angeles. And uh, many of these great properties are gonna stay just as they are. We have parks and municipal facilities, et cetera. But we also own commercial, industrial, retail, residential. We own parking lots, we own empty lots. Imagine if we just actually put a few of those to a little bit better use and the uh, uh, economic value and the uh, community value that that would have. And this is, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> So all of this is really about driving uh, an agenda for transparency, for accountability, for accessibility, for openness, for innovation, and also, by the way, for collaboration. Uh, I really wanted to thank uh, the neighborhood councils for each and every each and every one of you for all the things that you're doing. Also, the collaboration that exists. I, I see here uh, uh, Paul Kerkorian, who's our budget and finance chair. Uh, thank you so very much for all the work that you do and for the thoughtfulness and for the for the discipline that you apply to our uh, budgeting process. Um, to the mayor's office, and you also heard from uh, Council Member Wesson as well. Thank you so much for their work. So um, let me give you a little um, uh, overview of a couple of things uh, relating to the resources that we have available and also a little bit of a summary of the year that was. We talked about the budget that is coming, uh, but we're also uh, putting up there uh, that which happened because you've got to look at what occurred uh, as you move forward. So among the things that we do in our financial reports is the thing called the CAFR, which is the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. That's a mouthful. Uh, it's actually a phone book sized uh, report uh, that we do every year. Uh, we call it sort of our uh, report for Wall Street. Uh, they look at it very carefully. Um, and then we also uh, are aware, though, that not everybody is going to read every page of that phone book. I do. I really enjoy it. Um, but I know that not everybody does. So uh, we created actually a, another version of this, which is the Community Financial Report. It's a uh, maybe the Reader's Digest, shall we say, of, um, of financial reports. And uh, we call it our report for uh, Main Street as opposed to uh, for Wall Street. So I'll show you a little bit about this interactive dashboard uh, where we've got uh, all sorts of operating information and um, 
up here, first of all, this is sort of the, uh, the cover page of the, uh, of the community CAFR as it's known. Uh, we've gotten awards actually, I'm proud to say, from the um, uh, Government Finance Officers Association uh, for the fact that we put out the first sort of digital uh, version of this. And we show categories for public safety, for transportation, public works, for our three proprietaries, as it were, those being the, uh, the Harbor, the uh, Department of Water and Power, and for uh, LAWA, Los Angeles World, airports. Um, now let's go to a uh, general fund and you can see here uh, the various general fund expend, actually these are the revenues. Uh, our number one of course is property tax. By the way we get just a portion of the property tax that is collected uh, but it is a very important portion uh, for us. Uh, other top general fund revenue sources uh, include fees, fines, penalties, utility users tax, uh, business taxes, sales taxes, all sorts of other taxes and revenue. What would we do without taxes, right? Um, those two things that are sure in life, taxes and you know what the other one is. Um, and uh, in addition to uh, the general fund, uh, there was made mention here of the fact that there's been a, a larger growth in these special funds. There are actually 945 special funds. There is a special fund for everything you could possibly imagine, and even for a few things that you might not be able to. Uh, and we were the first ones to put up an accounting of each of these. Uh, you can actually see what's going in, what's going out in almost uh, real time, uh, along with the name of the one individual in the city responsible for that account and their phone number and their email. Uh, but um, Councilmember Krikorian has also been a, a great partner in this, in that uh, we're going to be spending a lot more effort on these special funds and the opportunities that exist with them uh, in, the, uh, in the coming year. And actually, we have a report coming out on this, uh, which is going to lay out a, a strategy for uh, how we go about extracting, shall we say, more money from some of these. Um, this next slide is about what's known as net position, and it's the financial position of the city after you subtract uh, liabilities and deferred inflows of resources, basically what the city owes. Um, and you can see the net position is nearly $20 billion. That's actually quite strong. Um, but let's also note that what it doesn't fully take into account is so much of the deferred uh, maintenance that we have uh, in terms of our infrastructure. On the other hand, it doesn't really give you the full value of all the real estate that we own because the real estate that we have in that number is book value, and in fact, it's worth quite a bit more. Um, next slide is about protection of people and property. This includes police, fire, animal services. You can see the trend in the number of arrests made. Uh, you can see the uh, trend in number of crimes reported, and there's a lot of other things that you can go to uh, when you go to this uh, at lacontroller.org, uh, by the way, and you'll find all sorts of ways that you can click deeper and deeper into this. Um, another one of the categories is public works. Uh, this includes the various bureaus of the public works, uh, engineering, street lighting, street services, others. We, by the way, conducted a number of audits around these, uh, including uh, how do we get more out of SDRF, at street damage restoration fees that are supposed to be paid by utility companies, and uh, more on this actually in the coming weeks and a plan to collect significantly more from them. Uh, also a uh, forthcoming audit on street sweeping. Uh, we've got facts and indicators. This is the economy panel that I mentioned. 50 different indicators uh, in terms of uh, where are uh, the most building permits happening in the city of Los Angeles, uh, employment numbers, uh, all sorts of demographic information. Uh, if you're trying to figure out where to locate your next Starbucks, this is the place to go and figure that out. Um, we've got a glossary so that you can learn to talk like accountants. Everybody wants to learn to talk like an accountant, right? Um, everything from um, accounting terms like encumbrances, accrual basis, uh, net position, and more. So you can uh, check this all out at lacontroller.org uh, or follow us on Twitter at Ron Galperin. And uh, most importantly, thank you so much for your spending uh, your Saturday morning uh, here in uh, City Hall, uh, your house. And uh, I've also decided as my, as my act for uh, this morning, as city controller, I'm going to unilaterally double your pay. Uh, wow. <laughs> thank you so very much. Wow. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, thank you. And next we have is Council Member Paul Krikorian. He is the chair of the Budget and Finance Committee. Welcome. Thank you. 
Good morning, everybody. So first of all, just to dovetail on our controller's comments, let me start this off by thanking you, uh, profoundly thanking you. Because when I look around at this room, and I see a lot of people that I've worked with since I've been on the council, and I see a lot of new people as well, when I see you all here on a Saturday morning listening to presentation after presentation after presentation about the city's budget, you are inspiring me uh, because we are living in a time right now of civic disengagement. We're living at a time when we're fortunate if we can get 10% of the people in our population even to vote, and you are devoting your own time on a weekend here to make our city better, and I am profoundly grateful to you for that. And, and let me just put that into a context, if I can, because for those of you who've been here a while, you know this. For those of you who may be new, maybe you don't know this, but 15 years ago, the San Fernando Valley was ready to secede from the city of Los Angeles. And as they were doing that, Hollywood raised its hand and said, maybe we should go too. And San Pedro said, maybe we should go too. And this city, this historic, over 200-year-old city, the second largest city in America, was about to disintegrate as we know it. And that narrowly, uh, we, we just narrowly avoided that happening. But what happened as a result of that was the Neighborhood Council movement, which continues today to be able to address the very things that were underlying that desire for secession. The fact that neighborhoods were not being listened to, that people in City Hall stayed in City Hall and never got any input from outside of this building. All of you and the engagement that you've been involved with are helping us to cure that. And I want to say just what you just saw from our city controller, a citywide elected official, our, our controller has, been, has given you all of these tools that you can use now that are unprecedented. It, you have access to information that 15 or 20 years ago would have been like national secrets that would have been, you know, like things that were hidden away in a safe in the Pentagon someplace. And Ron Galperin is giving that to you and saying, here it is. Let's work together to make this better. Use this information and, and let's figure out how we can work more effectively to govern the city. And it's working. It's working thanks to you. It's working thanks to our controller and thanks to our mayor and thanks to a city council president and my colleagues who are listening to you now. And um, one of the first, uh, I've been now budget chair, f I was uh, s named budget chair in 2012. So one of the very first things that I decided to do was to ensure that the neighborhood council budget advocates fully participated in the extensive budget hearings that we have every time we consider a budget. Instead of having you come up and fill out a card as a, as a speaker, you sit at that table. You sit at that table just the same as a department general manager, just the same as our CAO, just the same as our mayor's budget team, just the same as our public employee unions. You sit right at that table and fully participate with your white paper, with your presentations, with the research that you've done uh, in our budget hearings. And you make our process better. So thank you. Um, and let me just step back now because you've gotten a lot of kind of dense information this morning, and it's been great. And um, I, I was just, Ron, I was just telling my staff, you know, when I see you do your presentations, I really have PowerPoint envy. I, you just have these great, you know, it's like one thing after the other, and panels and dashboards and stuff I don't even understand, and it's, it's great. Um, so I don't have that, forgive me, but I, I, I do want to just take one step back from these details that, that you've heard and put it into a little bit of a larger context for you. So you fully, not just understand in your, in your head, but in your gut and in your heart how vitally important your work is. So I was elected in 2010. And at that time, uh, when I was sworn in, uh, this city was facing the most severe financial crisis it had ever experienced. Um, we were two years mm -hmm. out of the total 
international economic meltdown that left this city reeling and on the verge of economic collapse. Um, and it was in that context that Council President gave me the honor of serving as budget chair, which, I, which was an honor that I was more than willing to decline, but he insisted. Um, and so in 2010, the CAO was projecting a budget deficit uh, four years from then, in just the next four years, of a billion dollars. And at that time, the general fund was four billion dollars. And they were projecting a billion dollar deficit in just four years um, because of the collapse of revenues and the increase uh, in expenses. So as a result of those projections and the fact that it didn't look like there was going to be anything changing anytime soon, m former Mayor Reardon, you may remember this, former Mayor Reardon wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal for the entire nation to see that said, it's inevitable that Los Angeles will file for bankruptcy, so they might as well do it now. They should do it now before any more damage is done. Just file for bankruptcy. So that was in 2012, 2013. It was right around when I became budget chair. Um, it, yeah, it, thanks, Herb. I just <laughs> but I do thank Herb, because as a result of the work that we've done in this council, that, I, that two mayors have now done, and that all of you have done, and that p folks in labor have done, and that so many others working together have done in this city, we pulled the city back from the brink. Not only did we not file for bankruptcy, but we realized efficiencies in our departments, we targeted new and thoughtful way of doing things, like, like our controller has said, using special funds and other things, identifying different sources of revenues, uh, creating efficiencies, reducing the size of our workforce. Not something, by the way, that is a good thing, you know, necessarily, except in times of crisis, because a reduced workforce means reduced services in your neighborhoods. We get that. But it was a time of crisis, so we got through that. We did uh, pension reform. We uh, did a number of other things. And we worked to try to get the economy back on track. And it is. And as a result, revenues have come up while we've realized these efficiencies. The result of that is not only did we not file for bankruptcy, but as you heard Matt Zabo describing today, we are now finally at a point where we are restoring services. We're growing the fire department for the first time in, in many years. We're uh, adding to a number of the things that are really critical to all of you. And we have realized historic uh, uh, reserve funds. We have managed to very carefully build up our piggy bank because when the next economic downturn comes, and it will, we don't want to be caught flat-footed like we were then and say, you know, well, you know, the, the revenues have collapsed, so we got to cut services. So over the last three years, we've had the highest reserves that this city has ever had in its entire history. In addition to our 5% reserves, it was our financial goal for years. We never met that goal until, you know, th these last few years when, I, when we've, we've managed to build this up. We built up the reserve fund. We added $100 million in a budget stabilization fund that can only be tapped into when revenues decline. So we're in a much stronger position than we had ever been in the past. That's the good news. Now here's the bad news. Um, and, and I need you all to be engaged in this bad news too, um, both to help us cure it. it, it it's not going to happen, Ann. So <laughs> thank you. But So both in able to, to be able to cure that problem, but also to be able to communicate with your constituents in your community so we can work together for a community-wide solution to this. Number one, um, there will be an economic downturn. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it is going to happen. We can't keep growing the way we've been growing forever. Number two, we have an administration in Washington um, that is determined to cut funding for local governments across the board. Um, and for years now, we've been backfilling federal funding losses for basic things like, like senior meals and some of the other really fundamental things that we value and care about in the city. We've been paying for it because federal funding has been cut. That's going to get worse. Liability. Matt Zabo mentioned liability a little bit, and the controller mentioned the, the uh, work that we've done in his, his panel on that. Liability has been spiking in this city. 
Um, I mean spiking, like doubling. And so uh, I've been working very hard with the mayor and with the city attorney on a risk management strategy to try to reduce those liability costs and, and, and more honestly budget for them. Knowing that they're going up, we got to budget for them. Uh, so uh, federal funding liability um, downturn. Um, oh, and uh, Matt mentioned the potential for additional contributions to our, our pension funds, which is a very real risk. So with all of those things, now is not the time to start spending like drunken sailors. And, uh, you know, every time, but, and, and here's what happens in government. If you haven't noticed this, this happens in government. It probably happens in any organization of people. As soon as there's a little bit of a surplus, people start looking around and say, well, what should we spend it on? You know, great, we got a surplus. It's time to start spending on the things that we've been cutting back on. We cannot do that. We have to do it thoughtfully and methodically and restore only the highest priorities first and continue to be very uh, uh, careful about preserving that reserve fund, that vital reserve fund. Because we've done that, uh, our credit rating was just upgraded. The city's credit rating was upgraded again. And the Standard & Poor's said it was because of management and economic strength. So we have to maintain that so that we don't get back into the bad old days of just eight or nine years ago. A final, final point, and then I'm gonna close. These, it, it isn't for everyone. I mean, we have our problems in this city. We have spiking homelessness. We have a lot of problems. We, we still have unemployment that's too high, still too hard to do business in this city. We have a lot of problems where our economic benefit is not affecting everyone. But I have to tell you, these are really booming times in Los Angeles. We have to spread it more broadly. We have to make sure that everybody benefits from it. But when you look around, yesterday I was at the opening of the largest building west of the Mississippi River. Korean Airlines invested over a billion dollars in Los Angeles. These are people who can invest anywhere in the world. They're making bets on the future of Los Angeles. All of you, maybe not all of you, but the vast majority of Angelinos voted to tax themselves to invest in our transportation infrastructure with Measure M. Uh, we voted to support Measure H and Measure HHH to attack homelessness. All of those are steps that the people of Los Angeles and the people of the world who have money, uh, are, these are statements that they believe in the future of Los Angeles. And I know you do, and that's why you're here. Believe me, I do. Uh, if we continue to work together the way we've been doing, our best times really are still ahead of us. And for that, I thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, thank you. Next we have the Los Angeles Times. Oh. Thank you. To review this and make sure because it, it, it indicates which proposals um, are already underway, which proposals are being analyzed. Sorry, uh, which proposals are being analyzed, um, which have been considered, and so on. There are also some new proposals in here which we're going to be uh, working on over the coming months. Um, but I urge you to review this uh, and continue to work with us to make sure that those things that can be done are being done to the greatest extent that they can. So uh, this is available on the council file for this year's budget. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Paul. So glad you came and added that, actually. That's good. <laughs> okay. So next I'd like to introduce the Los Angeles Times editorial board member, Carrie Cavanaugh. Hi. Thanks for inviting me. So um, just a little description of what I do. I work for the Los Angeles Times editorial board. We're about seven people. We work for the opinion section, and we write the unsigned editorials of the newspaper. We interview candidates, we do endorsements. Um, so when I write, I write with an opinion, I write with the perspective of the newspaper. Um, so uh, thanks for inviting me here. Um, I was invited after I wrote an editorial um, in advance of the release of the city budget in which um, I sort of took somewhat issue with the mayor's um, very optimistic stance that everything's great in LA and we're doing fantastic. And, and that is true, 
um, on the surface. Things are looking really good. Um, at the surface level, um, there's a tremendous infusion of money, thanks to the voters, thanks to, to some things that the legislature did. Um, but below the surface, there are some longstanding problems that are, um, I would argue, maybe not adequately being addressed. Um, there's a couple of trends that most of the major new investments that we're seeing, most of the new uh, spending that we're seeing, are um, the result of tax increases or um, uh, ballot measures that have been put on by the voters. So a lot of the homeless funding, tremendous investments that the voters decided to do, but uh, the homeless housing we're building, HHH, um, the street repairs we're going to be seeing, that's a result of fuel taxes that the legislature increased. Um, that's a result of Measure M, which voters passed to fund transit development and highways, and that's going to give money for street repair as well. Um, part, for example, the city raised Quinby fees. Those are the park fees that developers pay. That's going to be what's funding your park development in the future. Um, there's new fees on developers that's going to pay for the community plan uh, updates, and that's a vital, vital program that will finally update the very, very old community plans. And that's traditionally something that had been funded through the general fund, but now uh, the city has raised the fees on developers to, to pay for that. So there's a trend going on that a lot of your service increases and programs are being funded externally, not necessarily through the general fund. We can have a debate over whether that's good or bad, but it's just, it is what it is. Um, so in 2013 or so, um, then CAO Miguel Santana and Mayor Garcetti had said, listen, in four years, we're gonna eliminate the structural deficit, and that's the sort of ongoing deficit that the city has, you know, revenues are lower than what the expenses are. And that was great because when you eliminate the structural deficit, the city has more money and more flexibility to invest. They can start doing um, technology upgrades, so you have more automation, you have more automatic bill paying and things like that as opposed to everything being done through paper. Um, you have, again, just more sort of investments in uh, efficiency and also just not pushing off long-term infrastructure projects that are needed and that sometimes get the city into lawsuits. For example, when there's pot potholes and uneven streets and a bicyclist hits it and then gets injured and sues the city. So th that structural deficit was again projected to be eliminated, I think 2018. It it's not, there's carrying over another about a $200 million structure, uh, that deficit is continuing. So again, that's, we talk about sort of what's below the surface that that continued structural deficit is an ongoing problem. Um, Matt Zabo mentioned it, um, the change in the pension rate of return, um, that's gonna cost the city a lot of money. We are just about to enter into new rounds of labor negotiations. Um, I don't know if you've seen the coverage of the, there's a D new DWP contract that's forecasting raises and um, continued full payment of, of um, uh, healthcare for employees. So, so these sort of, these problems that had been attempted to address, again, eliminate the structural deficit, sort of curtail the costs of, of labor contracts, um, those problems are still sort of out there, and when there is a recession, which inevitably will come, um, you know, the concern is that we will again find ourselves in straits of having to cut services, uh, cut, you know, lay off people, and just sort of, again, tighten up in the city. Um, And again, the reason why this matters is just, uh, if you think about the things that people come to the neighborhood councils and ask for, they want, let's, how do we get this program? How do we get the services? How do we get our parks maintained? Um, you can't do any of that if you don't have the money and if you're constantly going from year to year to year, um, always sort of zeroing out a deficit at the end of the year and then starting from scratch the next year. So that's, that was our perspective from the LA Times. And my other plug is, um, I don't know this nearly as well as all of you, so please consider this an open invitation to uh, tell me what you think about the city budget, what's going on in City Hall, um, carrie.cavanaugh.latimes.com. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> so next I'd like to introduce Maria Gutierrez, she is a lead financial analyst from the CAO's office. Welcome, Maria.
Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my apologies on behalf of Mr. Rich Llewellyn, who is our interim CAO today, who is not able to be here, but um, I'm very honored to be here in front of you today. Um, my work with the CAO's office has been about 10 years. Um, prior to that, I worked with the Chief Legislative Analyst Office um, in the capacity of supporting the work of both the mayor and council uh, in the management of the city budget. Uh, my current assignment is uh, preparing the financial status reports, um, which we post on our websites regularly, which basically provides an update of the status of the city's finances. So we provide them quarterly, um, or uh, more frequently as necessary. Um, these reports are available on our website. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about a couple things. I'm gonna provide a recap of our current year budget. Um, we're gonna talk about next year's uh, budget, our authorized city staffing, our general fund revenues, and our city's current strengths and concerns uh, on the horizon. Uh, a little bit about our city pension systems, and our budget outlook for the next four years. So for those of you um, who are interested in these handouts, um, I did provide handouts. I'm sure they were made available somewhere in the back or outside in the front desk. Um, our reserve fund balances are strong. We began fiscal year 1617 with reserve, a reserve fund of about 5.99%. As you know, our reserve fund policy is 5%. Our total reserves are 7.94%, which is strong. After addressing unanticipated liability expenditures and other shortfalls, our reserve fund continues to be strong and is estimated in the adopted budget to be at 6.7% at year end. When we include our budget stabilization funds, our total reserves are estimated at 8.4% at year end. As indicated earlier, we do, our office does prepare these quarterly financial status reports where you can get information on the status of each department budget and then the city as a whole and the progress that we're making in, in balancing our budget. Earlier this year, we did report significant shortfalls. Some of our challenges were mainly driven by the increased expenditures for liability claims. At mid-year, our shortfall was projected at 57 million. By year end, we had managed these shortfalls uh, due in part to the leadership of our mayor and council and surpluses that we identified within budgeted funds, city departments, and additional revenue that was, uh, that was identified. However, um, because of our robust reserve fund this year, we were able to use the reserve fund to pay for the unanticipated liability claims expenditures. This table provides a snapshot of our uh, budget for next year. Uh, as discussed by our earlier speakers, uh, our general fund uh, budget has grown by approximately 4.5%. Our special funds show growth of about 8.3% for next year. Our overall budget has increased by about 5.9% when we account for both our general fund and our special funds. Um, and as you know, our general fund is what we use for our day-to-day uh, -day operating expenditures. Uh, special funds may be limited in their scope of what we can use them for. Um, we continue to work towards meeting our, our financial policies. Um, some highlights include uh, we've appropriated 1.28% of general fund towards capital improvements. Um, this exceeds our target of 1%. Our reserve fund is at 5.12% of the general fund revenues, which is still above the 5% policy goal. We have showing, um, while we have nominal deposits to the budget stabilization fund, um, we uh, are spending uh, 75 million of the growth and economically sensitive tax revenues um, on budgeted capital improvements. We've used our one-time revenues for one-time expenditures. So the bottom chart, in the bottom chart, you will see um, how we've done uh, in uh, budgeting for our reserves. Uh, if you look at all the, the, the bar to the left, that's 
and our total reserves were at 3.64%. Um, through the years, we've added the Budget Stabilization Fund, and uh, we have taken steps to meet that 5% policy goal uh, with the reserve fund. You'll see the highest bar is 2015-16, where our total reserves were at 10.47%, which is the highest. And this was due in part to uh, additional receipts that were received throughout the year, uh, unallocated revenue. Where did this money go, you ask? Ah, we use these funds for startup funding for homelessness. But because of our liability claim challenges, we also had to use these funds to pay for our liability claims. And we had to do the same this fiscal year, 2016-17. So our next year's, uh, or for 17-18 adopted budget, our total reserves are at 7.09%. So next, we'll look at where are we with our staffing. Um, this table only shows uh, staffing for city council control departments. So that means it does not include staffing at the harbor, uh, at uh, fire and police pension systems, or uh, Department of Water and Power and airports. But you will see, in 2007-8 was when we had our highest city staffing. And then if you look at 2009-10, where staffing starts to dip lower, is when we had our early retirement program, ERIP. Looking at 17-18, we're showing steadily growth. However, since our peak at 2007-8, we have had a decline of approximately 10.2% in staffing, which amounts to about 3,798 staff. This chart shows our city's uh, seven general fund taxes and change from year to year. This is inclusive of property tax, utility tax, business tax, sales tax, um, what we call um, transition occupancy tax, the hotel tax, documentary tax, and parking tax. The four bars on the right show our projections for the next four years. While this chart shows that our revenues continue to show steady growth, this growth is mainly being driven by property tax and transient occupancy tax, or also known as the hotel tax. But what's interesting to point out with this transient occupancy tax, it, it also is inclusive of these, uh, uh, the Airbnb agreement. Um, what you don't see here is, because we don't have a crystal ball, nobody knows where the when the economic downturn is coming. So you'll see steady growth in revenues. This shows the changes in our general fund revenue uh, from the prior fiscal year. The dark blue on the bottom represents property tax, which is our largest tax. Again, we see steady growth. The table on the upper left shows changes from the prior year, and you'll see that um, one of our biggest increases was in license permits, fees, and fines. And this is partly due to the uh, MTA contract with that police department uh, monitoring of the metro rail systems and buses. So there's a new contract there. So while we are getting additional revenue of approximately 56 million, we also have to uh, appropriate this money to police for overtime. So it's coming in and it's being spent. There's also a large increase for the transient occupancy tax. Again, that is illustrative also of um, inclusive of the Airbnb agreement. And as you know, some of these, uh, this 
is still under a policy consideration with your council. So there are some as major assumptions included in this chart. Our outlook, which is to the right of the dotted line, so our projections uh, for the next four years, incorporates the uh, recent uh, proposed Department of Water and Power transfer settlement. But as you know, class action is pending court approval, but we've made some assumptions in this chart. So our city does have uh, major strengths, and we also have some concerns for the future. We continue to strive and work hard to meet our financial policies on an ongoing basis. Um, we have budgeted for the unappropriated balance, uh, approximately 20 million, and this is where, uh, prior to tapping into the reserve fund, uh, we tap into this funding source to address any unforeseen expenditures in the current year. So it's budgeted at 20 million for next year. As mentioned earlier, uh, there are new voter approved revenue sources for infrastructure and other city priorities. One of the major ones is Proposition HHH for city homelessness for the issuance of 1.2 billion bond authorization. Um, our office recently released a report uh, on uh, a bond issuance uh, which is coming up. Uh, we also have Measure H for county homelessness, uh, $355 million annually that the city expects to benefit from through uh, LASA. And there's Measure M, LA County, approximately $860 million annually for traffic improvements. We've budgeted uh, about $39.1 million from this funding source for this next year. And lastly, we have new state gas tax legislation, which provides additional funds for the city's transportation needs. This is known as SB1. But despite these strengths, we also have major concerns. First and foremost, we have budget increases of about 40 million for liability claims. While a positive step, it is still below our actual expenditure levels of recent years. So this year alone, we're spending upwards of $145 million in liability claims. However, this estimate does not include funding that was set aside um, for other uh, significant cases. Uh, I see I have two minutes, so I'm just going to run through these uh, new revenue sources that are still pending council action. As you know, billboards, just $12 million tied to that. The linkage fee, $10 million is tied to that. Other existing revenue sources that may be impacted by policy changes, Airbnb, gas tech franchise fees, solid waste franchise fees. Other concerns, of course, future pension costs, federal budgetary impacts in the city based on what happens in Washington, and our ongoing infrastructure needs. The big one, of course, is the pension system. The bar in green is uh, LAFPP, Fire and Police Pension System. The blue is uh, City Employees Retirement System. LAFPP is for our sworn employees. LACERS is civilian. These illustrations do not reflect our latest actions taken by the Fire and Police Pension System or the actions to be taken by LACERS. As discussed earlier by our speakers, um, these are expected to have significant impact on the City's general fund budget. Here we have our forecast, where we are showing expenditures exceeding revenues, um, unless actions are taken to mitigate these. In 2021-22, we're showing a modest surplus of 17 million. But prior to that, you can see significant shortfall shortfalls, which we will have to work towards resolving. Assumptions that are made in this chart is that revenue growth uh, in future years will match our historical uh, averages of 3%, so steady revenue growth, no economic downturn. That our current service levels will be maintained, no increases or decreases. That employee salary changes will be limited to our current negotiated agreements, and many contracts, as you know, will expire in 1819, 1920. 
So you'll see our challenges ahead. Our office will work together with the mayor and council to, to manage these challenges. Um, my time is up, but if you like more information, it is available on our website. Uh, thank you very much, thank Maria. You very much. That is a lot of information. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Bridget Kidd. She is a budget advocate, and she is going to give us a point of view from a budget advocate's perspective. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, yes, my name is Bridget Kidd, and I am a 2016-17 budget advocate. And last year, I had no idea what a budget advocate was. I sat here uh, because I was a treasurer of Zapata King Neighborhood Council, and by default, you're supposed to come to represent your council. So I sat just where you're sitting, and I heard Danielle Sandoval talk about her experience as a budget advocate. And so I don't remember everything she said, but she did say you're going to learn a lot. She is so right. This has been the best on-the-job training I have ever had. I could have not read enough government books or taken enough classes to have the information that I have today. So I wanted to share with you guys who are coming to be budget advocates uh, through the election process a few things that helped me actually facilitate the learning. The first is to be open. Be open to learning, be open to listening. Because the things that I thought were true were not true. The things that I thought I knew, I did not know. The city budget is complex and complicated. That general fund that they're talking about, and she just spoke about all those line items, it seems like, oh, I'm not a numbers person. I'm just going to go to sleep right now. That's not the case. If you are a property owner, if you are own a small business, if you work, if you do anything in this city, that general fund does impact you. So one of the things that I did first off as a budget advocate is that you get the choice to set up a meeting with all those city departments that make up that general fund. So I selected information technology, the agency with uh, general manager Ted Ross. And Brian and I got to meet with him and learn all the things that work and that don't work fiscally for innovation. So you heard many people talk this morning about the innovation process needs to be upgraded. We were in support of that, especially coming from the private sector, being able to go onto LinkedIn, apply for a job and get an immediate response is totally different when you're interviewing for a city position. So we were in agreement with pushing that technology forward. So you get to compile a report that then becomes the white paper that everybody talks about. That white paper is then submitted to the budget, uh, to the mayor um, and evaluated to be able to add it or to make some changes or to at least take the advice of what we learned as budget advocates. So that was a great part. I was a chair. I wrote that paper. You get whatever skills you have now. If it's not math, it doesn't matter. Bring it because it is well utilized as a budget advocate or a budget representative. The second thing is that Ask questions, answer questions. I had that first experience because, as you know, as a budget advocate, you get two or three other neighborhood councils that you have to meet with them every month, and you update them on the things that are taking place at the, with the budget advocates' meetings. And I was assigned South Central and Watts Neighborhood Council. So my first visit at Watts Neighborhood Council, I updated, and then I got questions from stakeholders, which is, this is what you do. You bring back the information. And they asked me, what do we do about a, a malfunctioning camera that's taking place on the metro line that's ticketing people? I'm a budget advocate, just became a budget advocate, didn't know. I said to him, oh, let me take that back. And I went back to our co-chair, Jay, and sent an email to Liz to say, hey, what do we do about people who are having problems with tickets? So Jay gave me a whole bunch of resources. And then, long story short, Adrian Evers and I and the stakeholder, Mr. Turner, worked together, and it became newsworthy. And then the mayor responded. All those tickets were issued were illegal tickets and the people can be refunded. Had I not gone to the Watts, oh, sorry, the Watts Neighborhood Council meeting, I would have not heard that. And then me going to ask the question to Jay and Liz, what do we do or can we do anything about it, then solve the problem. So it does affect that general fund, right? And it, it does affect the general fund because you heard them mention the seven ways of revenue, seven taxes for revenue. Parking fines is, you know, it's 10% of the parking fines. So if you have a whole bunch of tickets coming in, you're going to get 10% of those. But you want those tickets to be legitimate. The last thing I want to share with you is the collaboration. One of the things that we're often in our own communities, and we're more alike than we're unalike. And I got to work with a number of budget advocates, um, doing budget advocate work, as well as doing things outside of 
um, the budget advocate process. One of them, again, was working with Adrian Edwards with City Watch articles. We got to publish things about the city. Uh, we made a lot of connections in regards to people now ask us what's going on. Can you share with us? Have you heard anything? What's happening in your community? The second thing was that I worked with Valida Gori, uh, Yvette Ale. I worked with um, Julie Berg. We did our regional budget day, and that's where we come to in our area, and we work with two or three regions, Region 9 or Region 10, and we put together a budget day where we actually, again, get the feedback from the stakeholders that we can bring back to budgets, to the budget advocates, and decide how it's, you know, how can we make change or how can we push forward a resolution for the city to know this is going on. Uh, one of the other things I did outside, that's why I said once you make this collaboration and you work with people, you can do other things. If you're civically engaged, you can do other things. So the last thing I did was work with Jacqueline Kennedy and Ron Gochez, and we did immigration workshops hosted at USC. Had I not met her then, then I would not have been able to do that next part, which is outside the advocacy. So being a budget advocate for me has been time well spent. It's the best, best lesson you can get and the best investment of your time. So I hope you guys really consider that when you come on board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bridget. And last but not least, we have Liz Amsden. She is our co-chair. Without her and Jay, I don't know. I don't know what we would do. So <laughs> thank you. You do very well. Uh, but I would like to thank all our speakers who shared their time and knowledge. And thank you, Bridget. That was great. And my fellow budget advocates whose hard work this year has made this a success. Uh, and Jacqueline, who stepped in to channel Jay. And of course, Jay himself, who unfortunately can't be here, and who is in many ways the heart and soul of our budget advocate group. My turn. People act out of self-interest. There's inertia, there's survival, there's love and family and friends, job security, a bigger house, good schools, the desire to drive a faster car, that the bar down the street doesn't allow patrons to smoke outside, that people share your religious beliefs, oppose war, all sorts of interest, uh, interests on which we base our choices. We are dependent on other people and our choices reflect that. And politicians are no different. Not surprisingly, elected officials respond to those on whom they depend. And even if they have the most wonderful intentions, if they do not hear long enough and loudly enough from the voters, from us, they will end up solely serving the interests of those who gave them the funds to run in the first place. And sadly, special interest money rarely comes from those who share our views. So it's in our best interest, yours, mine, everyone's, to take our own needs to those in government because they are not in the business of reading minds. And in fact, they often assume everyone shares their perceptions. Remember the first George Bush who had no idea about the price of milk? We need to educate them. And like Herb Wesson and, um, said, our council members and their staffs do want to hear from you. They need our voices. They want us to push them to enact policies that will benefit us, benefit us, especially as Matt Zabo laid out, rebuilding the infrastructure we so desperately need. And holding the fire to their feet, holding them accountable to get, get us the outcomes we deserve. We've heard from some important people today, well, maybe in our own minds, uh, but our city government has incredible power to affect our lives for good and not for so good by drafting law, by voting for it, and by putting it into place. And you have power too. If you choose to become civically engaged, whether by writing an article on how things can be better, or calling your council member's office, on your neighborhood council's monitoring delivery of city services, and by working with the budget advocates to augment your voice on budget-related issues and the need for the city to respond to its residents. Right now, we want to hear from you, all of you. We need to hear from you. Right now, we want you to go upstairs, join us on the 10th floor uh, in regional budget meetings and tell us what you want, what you can give, what you believe has to be changed in your neighborhood and what we need to get rid of. This is the wonderful option the Los Angeles City Council, the Neighborhood Council system gives us, a real voice at City Hall. So please, join us upstairs, 10th floor now, and have your attendance here today make a real difference. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your attendance today. Let's keep on making this city great. Thank you.